Welcome to the 2006 Darcy Lecture, All Models Are Wrong, How Do We Know Which Are Useful? Before I begin, I would like to thank the National Groundwater Association for funding travel to 60 lectures on five continents this year, and to thank my colleagues at the Hydrologic Science and Engineering Program at Colorado School of Mines and the International Groundwater Modeling Center because they took up a lot of slack while I was away this year. In particular, John McRae, Dave Benson, Mike Gusev, and Sophia So. For me, whenever we do groundwater hydrology work, from the very first moment we're already modeling. As we look down at the site from a hillside, or as the case might be in Nebraska from an airplane or a high building, we are already thinking about the extent of the model domain, the material properties in the model, the boundary conditions, and where en groundwater enters and leaves that system. So we're developing a conceptual model, a bit of a cartoon, and in this case, in the middle of Nebraska, we have the North and South Platte River flowing from west to east past a major reservoir. From that conceptual model, we might go on to develop analytical solutions using, say, Darcy's Law, the Tice Equation, or an analytical solution for contaminant transport. And from there, we may go on to make some elaborate computer model. And this is what most people think of when they think of groundwater modeling. They picture these detailed numerical grids on a computer. The methods that I talk about today are applicable to this type of modeling, but also to the analytical modeling and can compare the two. I will use groundwater flow and advective transport to illustrate the principles, but they are applicable to any kind of modeling that has quantitative input and output. So even if you're not in the groundwater hydrology field, I encourage you to think about how these methods may be of use in your work. First, let me give you a path through today's presentation. I will talk about why we model and how, and then why all our models are wrong. Now, if you're a groundwater modeler, this will be old information to you. But many of the people that come to the Darcy Lecture are either not modelers and perhaps not even hydrologists. So this gives them some background as to what groundwater hydrologists do so that they can keep up with us for the rest of the presentation. So bear with me until I get to how we know which models are useful and to talk about some tools I've been working on with a group of people that will help advance modeling in our field. And finally, a conclusion. This dashed line at the bottom of the screen will gradually turn white throughout the presentation so you can have some idea how far I've downloaded to you this afternoon. So first, why we model. As academicians, we often model just to help us understand the system. But for most practical applications, we model because there's a decision to be made. And when we make a decision, we either need to predict something or post-dict something as illustrated by this plume near Los Angeles that a student at Colorado School of Mines is working on. He has intermediate data about the condition of the plume and needs to look at where that plume will go and how it will evolve in the future under various scenarios, but also work backwards to determine when the material got into the subsurface because that influenced who's responsible for the plume today. Now, in addition to decision making, we also need models to help us integrate and synthesize because it's a bit much for us to hold in our minds all at once. So I'd like to show you the standard path we typically follow when we do a modeling project. We start by defining the problem and then developing the conceptual model as we talked about and then quantifying that into a mathematical model and making calculations. In our case, we calculate water levels, flow rates, concentrations, and inevitably, the first time that we make that simulation on the computer, we will find that the results don't match the items that we observed in the field. And so we will go through a process of calibration where we adjust the parameter values in an attempt to make the model better match what we've obser observed in the field. Until the 1990s, groundwater hydrologists pretty much did this by trial and error. And then some codes came along to help them, modflow P, PEST, and U-code, to help them with automated calibration. All of those codes use nonlinear regression to calibrate the model. If you haven't tried this automated calibration yet, I encourage you to do so. There's a bit of front-end learning to do, but you can take the time you would usually use to adjust parameter values in order to learn that process. And in the end, you'll have a better calibrated model and you'll know a lot more about your model because those processes give you information about the character of your model. 
Now, even if you use automated calibration, you'll still find that sometimes you can't get a good match to field data or that if you do, you've had to come up with unreasonable parameter values in order to achieve that match. For example, the hydraulic conductivity for a gravel might be lower than the hydraulic conductivity for a clay. And when that happens, it's usually because there's something wrong with the way we've set up the conceptual model. And so it's appropriate to come out of that process and loop back and revamp the conceptual model, possibly gather more data, and then come down, recalibrate, and go through this loop numerous times until you feel that you have a satisfactory model, and then conclude the study. And in most cases today, when we conclude the study, we conclude it with what we think is our one best model, and we use that for our recommendations and decisions. Now the problem is that the uncertainty that's associated with that one best model is actually fairly small compared to the uncertainty that's associated with the conceptual model that's underlying that model. And we can decide which model best fits our calibration data, but that does not necessarily give us a model that makes the best predictions. And I will show you this as we go through the presentation today. Now there's some hope because we can actually make our recommendations and decisions using the average results of multiple conceptual models, and we'll talk about how to do that as well. So first, I promised to talk a little bit about how we model. And for a very simple system where we have saturated flow, water filling all the pores, we use Darcy's law, and that relates the velocity of flow to the gradient in the system and the properties of the system. We combine that with the conservation of mass and come up with the groundwater flow equations. These equations are partial differential equations that describe the value of hydraulic head water level in space and time. And I've sketched here uh, the water levels around a pumping well and the inferred flow direction from those contours of the water levels. Now if we add other processes such as dispersion, partitioning, and reaction, we can develop the contaminant transport equations where we can calculate concentration as a function of space and time. Today's topic is not about these models themselves, but about evaluating the quality of these models. We can use these equations to solve analytically for simple systems, homogeneous systems with simple boundary and initial conditions. But the trouble is that when we go to our field sites, we have very complex systems to deal with. There's a lot of heterogeneity in space and time. For example, the site in Nebraska covers 1,000 square miles. And if we look at a cross-section of material on a road cut, for example, and here's a rock hammer for scale, we see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in that system in space. And also in time, because the irrigation wells are turning on and off all the time, the river levels are going up and down, flow rates are changing. And the challenge here is to manage a very large well field around that reservoir, pumps up to 80,000 gallons a minute, and optimize that management so as to minimize the impact on the surrounding farmer's irrigation wells, and to determine which farmers are impacted so they can be compensated. Now, in order to deal with this heterogeneity in space and time, we break the world into elements of space and steps of time, and then we define parameters that describe the material properties and the stresses on those elements and steps in time, and we solve simultaneously. And in this way, we're able to make the simple equations work for heterogeneous systems. But that causes a number of problems, four major problems. The first one is measurement accuracy and scale. So if you envision this outcrop that we looked at a moment ago being in the subsurface and we have four wells drilled into that and we make hydraulic tests and estimate the hydraulic conductivity at each one of those locations and of course depending on how we ran the test and interpreted it there's an uncertainty associated with each one of those measurements. Now if we'd like to take those measurements and put them into our model if the element in our model encompasses this entire area, we have to come up with one average value of hydraulic conductivity to represent that material and its uncertainty. Or if instead that area is represented by many elements, we have to interpolate and extrapolate to populate those elements with material properties. The second major problem is that we can't calculate the hydraulic head and 
concentrations for every microsecond of time. We have to lump time. And so you can see here we have various water levels in the river as a function of time. And if we run our model for something like 50 years, we may end up taking monthly time steps. So we would have to break those time steps into average values of head in the river for each month. And if we look at water levels in wells at varying distances from the river, we see those vary with time, but our model will only be able to predict one value of water level in each of those wells for each month of time. So you can see that we can measure a lot of detail, but not necessarily represent it all in our model. And you must realize there are many locations in space and time where we have no data at all. The third problem is our special spatial conceptualization. And here we have to aggregate in space because, again, our models cannot be built to, to represent every small micrometer of space because there just isn't enough computing power. So if we take a system like this where we have no flow boundaries on the west and east and at the base and a recharge at the top and homogeneous hydraulic conductivity throughout, I've sketched here the smooth hydraulic head field that would result. If we represent that with elements, we only get an average value of head for each element in the system. Then, if we measure head at a screened interval in a well and have an absolutely accurate measurement, no error in that measurement, and go to compare with our model, we have to interpolate between the two calculated values of head, and we see there's a difference here. So when we take our observed value minus our interpolated simulated value, we still have a residual, even though we knew the system perfectly and had no error in our measurement. The fourth problem is coming up with the scenarios. So we have to calibrate our models in history, and we have to predict into the future. For that, that means that for every element and every step in time, we have to come up with how did the humans affect that groundwater system, how much did they pump, how did the climate affect it, how much was recharged, and we have challenges predicting the weather for next week, so coming up with these scenarios for every element in space and step in time over the historic period and into the future is clearly a challenging uh, activity. So we can't measure everything. What we do measure has error in it and we have to aggregate in order to make our computations. And so as a result we have to calibrate our model. So here's a small piece of that system in Nebraska and there will be another number of wells then to match. Here's the water levels in wells as a function of time and also there's stream gauges. We can take the difference between the two and get the groundwater outflow to the river over time. So we work to adjust the parameter values until we can get a good match between what we observed in the field and what the model simulates. Let me give you a little glimpse of how we go about that calibration process by using a very simple system. This system has just two units, transmissivity one and two in the yellow and green. It has a constant head on the left side that's at this level on the graph at the top and a constant head on the right. And so given the true values of T1 and T2, this would be the head profile through the system and the outflow. Now, for working in the field, we would measure head at a various locations. Here's six of them and measure a flow rate somewhere. And we would try to minimize the sum of squared weighted residuals between the simulation on the computer and what we observed in the field. So for different values of T1 and T2, we could calculate the head and the flow rate at each location and then take the observed value in the field minus that value, square them up, weight them, usually by one over their measurement variance because that will make them unitless and it will provide more weight to the things that we know more accurately, and then sum them all up. And so if I show you for different values of T1 and T2, we have a different profile developing here. And if we make this sum of squared weighted residuals for each set of parameters, we can map a sum of squared weighted residual surface or an objective function surface. And what we're trying to find is the low point on that surface. So by various techniques, we start with some value of T1 and T2, and work our way down to the minimum. And if we started with a different set of T1 and T2, we would again be searching for that minimum. Now, the trouble is that we come up with the optimal values, the parameter values that best fit that data, but those are effective